and we'll see Liam. What's up, here. David? Yeah, good morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just real quick, we did uh, welcome everyone to the stage last night, all our new Tupper teachers. You are one. You were not here. A big round of applause for Liam. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Good to have Bombed, you. Uh, um, I'm not going to take up too much uh, of um, everyone's time with the intro. I think most people know who Liam is, what Liam has done. A lot of research, not only in the golf world and the baseball world. I was just reading up on you. Uh, your work in the baseball field has filled like a billion dollars in salaries. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, you know, I need, I need that. I need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. So, but if, if you're set to go, we're all here and, uh, we're excited. Um, and there'll be time for questions, but what, for this particular presentation, if there are questions at the end, we, um, uh, we will need, we will need to use the mic. Okay. Uh, so without further ado, Liam, everyone. Awesome. All right. Uh, Thanks, Anans. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, you know, gonna I'm gonna get right into it here right away. But I guess you know, before I get started, uh, thanks to the team at 8 a.m. Golf for accommodating my inability to travel. It'll be uh, should be fun doing it via Zoom. Hopefully, it's entertaining for you guys. Um, hopefully, uh, the tech stuff all works out. You know, I guess before we get going, I just wanted to share. You know, I suppose what what the objectives of this presentation are and really when it comes down to it, my hope is that we're going to arm everyone there in the room with information where you've got new, you know, new things to consider. You know, and so I hope that after we go through this, we're going to start to consider, um, you know, things like grip size and grip pressure as, you know, viable means to hit the easy button. You know, and ultimately help people get better faster, make swing changes faster, control their golf ball, shoot lower scores. So I'm going to uh, switch over here and let me uh, get rolling here. Okay. All right. Now, hopefully this is all working. We're going to get started. Um, you know, and the first thing, for those of you out there that have done research, you guys know how much time it takes and i just wanted to be transparent you know a lot of the legwork that's gone into the background of this uh while i've been involved and guided it i haven't necessarily been you know boots on the ground collecting the data so i wanted to give a shout out to carson howe uh he's our managing part of the toronto location 2022 pga canada teacher of the year brilliant guy unbelievable with tech um and also jonathan collins johnny's our head lab tech Several of you out there have met him. Some of you guys have had the chance to shoot content with him. Um, so not only did he do a lot of the data capture, the data collation, but also has helped a lot with visualization of, you know, what we found. So hopefully that's uh, helpful for you guys. Um, we're going to go back to kind of step one. Not going to spend much time on it. This is presented 2018 World Scientific Congress of Golf. Really simple study on grip size. We had like 11 different sizes of grip in our pro shop. Um, every club comes with standard grips on it. Didn't really make sense to me. Going through testing, we found out a couple of key things. Uh, number one, when you step on your teaching tee, you get back to work. Just know that four out of five people do not have the right grip size as it pertains to optimizing control of the golf ball. The second thing I want you to know is that we found a 0.00, .00 correlation between hand length and grip size. So this is something you have to test. There's a ton of variability. You don't need to go too much into it, but just know that we saw on average a 35% improvement reduction of shot dispersion with seven irons across a large sample set of golfers. So huge opportunity there. You know, the next step we went into was a preliminary study on grip pressure. And for this particular one, similar to the big one I'm gonna introduce, we use a sensor grip from Sensor Edge. We use gears full body motion capture. We use our GC quad to measure ball flight, club delivery, and of course, swing catalyst. To start off, we did a low handicap group and a high handicap group to see, is there any difference in the way people apply pressure to the handle of the golf club? Here's the process, it was pretty simple. You know, we wanted to mimic what it's like when these golfers go to play golf. So instead of having a structured warm up routine that may be too many shots for some people, not enough shots for other. It's literally, are you ready to go to the first tee? 
we use a dynamometer, get grip strength of lead and trail hand. Uh, we'll go through a grip calibration process to let you guys know how that works. Got a club here. Basically, as we get started, it'll have us squeeze the club as hard as we can with both hands. Then lead hand only, trail hand only. That's how it calibrates for hand width and also for um, a max grip pressure per individual. And you guys will get a chance to see some of that data come to life here shortly. Go ahead, had him hit 10 shots with one club, process all the data. Here's an ugly spreadsheet, deal with these a lot. Um, and this is what we saw. So uh, we presented this at the 2022 World Scientific Congress of Golf, Carson and I. Um, what we see with a low handicap player is represented the blue line. We saw them starting with less lead hand pressure, more variability throughout the swing, you know, a drop in lead hand grip pressure from top of backswing down through shaft parallel, and then, sorry, lead arm parallel, and then ramping back up quickly. With the high handicap players, we saw uh, increasing in trail hand grip pressure and overall kind of more constant, less variability. One of my favorite things about this was when we were actually 2021 at Pinehurst, um, Nick Clearwater with Golf Tech presented a similar study and our takeaway was like, yes, the data matches, love it. It's always a good thing. Now, uh, let's dive into what we've been spending the past, gosh, we're December, holy smokes, it's been 11 and a half months. So what we wanted to do was take that kind of really simple initial study, you know, really broad spectrum of golfers, and let's try and narrow it down. You know, for us specifically, let's narrow it down into the subsets of golfers that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We're also fortunate that we were able to get professional players to opt in so we could use them as a bit of a baseline for like, what do we see with good players? We had a group of players that chronically fight hooks, group of players that chronically slice, and a group of players that just really struggle with contact in general. As opposed to just using one club struck off the ground, we also expanded this study to include driver, iron, and then we did high and low 30-yard uh, wedge shots. Once again, uh, we use the sensor grip technology from Sensor Edge, gears, full body motion capture. What you'll notice this time was different about gears is we use the wrist calibration. I'm gonna show you guys some videos. So for some of you that are familiar with gears, if you see the hands looking a little different on the club, it's slightly different uh, avatar configuration, uh, GC quad for ball flight and uh, 2D video and ground force with our swing catalyst. Now, uh, also for the golf clubs, we wanted to provide something that was a little closer, I guess, to what the players used. We use a Stealth 2 10.5 head. We would adjust the loft to try and get a configuration as close as possible to what that player used. Uh, for the seven irons, we use the Ping I-525. Same thing again, we would go ahead and adjust the lie angle to match what that, current, uh, what that player's current specs were not what we think they should use, but what they did use. And uh, we use Cobra for the 58 degree wedges, kept the lie angle, or sorry, the loft constant, and again, adjusted the lie angle for that player. In terms of shafts, you know, we used uh, Club Connect's interchangeable shaft system. So we had two different driver shafts, M4 and M5 flex, two different seven iron shafts from LA Golf, again, M4, M5, and the same thing with the wedges. So uh, group one, professional players, uh, still small sample set, best we could get uh, three people in each group. There you can see our combined grip strength. The grip strength differential with these professional players was a little bit surprising, um, but you know, it is what it is. Take a look, there's our players at hook. Interestingly enough, even though they're amateurs, they had higher grip strength. We're not expecting that, although one of those particular players is also a long driver, so may have skewed the averages up a little bit. There's the players that slice, and there's our poor contact players. So, um, you know, with our members at the lab, we call them our lab rats, we were able to try and, we were able to pick kind of, I guess we'll say, players that we thought were your 
quintessential slicers or quintessential hookers, trying to get people that are, you know, say more normal for what we deal with day in, day out, not so much the outliers. Now, can we get into the process, subjective warm up? If you say you're ready, we'll believe you. We want to replicate what you're like on the first tee. Same thing, got grip strength from both hands with the dynamometer. And then we just had them take 10 shots with their own driver and their own seven iron to get a baseline of their full swing. From there, we went through, you know, the grip calibration, squeeze stuff that I talked to you about. And of course, the gears, uh, wrist calibration, which has the additional marker sets on the hands. Uh, we increased the sample size of shot capture this time. So we got 15 shots with the driver, 15 with the seven iron, 15 high wedges, 15 low wedges. Um, and then you get spreadsheets like this. So uh, let me see. You guys can probably read this easier than I am, but you know we basically charted anything that we thought might matter. Uh, obviously, grip pressure is in there, foot pressure is in there, uh, you know, pelvis turn, rib cage turn, lead arm adduction, wrist set angle, you know, a, a ton of stuff. Um, what we did in order to synchronize the different technologies, this was a challenge. Uh, the sensor grip product, it's good at identifying impact point from the actual vibration, yet it uses a webcam, which has lag. So we use the tech-based identification of the, uh, the pressure spike and impact, uh, the synchronized machine learning cameras from Swing Catalyst, and the impact timing on the gear system, and then actually had to work back off of impact. We were not able to work at a swing start position. So let's see what we see. All right, driver. Thankfully, this is pretty similar to what we saw before. Um, so these graphs, you're gonna see these go pretty consistently. If you look across at number one, right, that's address. As soon as the club starts moving, we're no longer at the address position. So right here, if we walk through this graph, we see this, um, our professional players, you know, they start with grip pressure skewed almost 65% towards the top hand. We see a slight drop as the shaft's parallel, fairly flat line as it gets to the top, dropping grip pressure as I get down to lead arm parallel, and then quite a big spike in that top hand grip pressure as I approach impact. Now, just to give you an idea, here's sort of what it looks like in real life. So the numbers, the big number in the middle is the distribution of grip pressure and the small number at the bottom, that's the percentage of max based on the squeeze test that's done at the beginning. You know, the, the pixelated graph, it's a little tricky to read at the start, but it allows us to see kind of down to each finger exactly what's going on. Bottom left, now you can see lead wrist ulnar deviation, which, you know, we kind of paired up to look at with uh, shift in pressure distribution. Two point five into out angle of attack slightly up. Um, also apologize in advance. You know, we're Canadian. 35% of our golfers are lefties, so some of you out there might not be used to kicking your brain back and forth between righty-lefty. Apologize, but that's uh, what we deal with in a hockey country. Okay, so here we've got um, the group of hookers. And so this is interesting. They started with more lead hand pressure, but also in that first move, found it interesting that they increased pressure. From there, it was a steady drop not just you know dropping from here to the top of the backswing, but continuing to drop down. We see a little bit of a spike as from lead arm parallel to shaft parallel, but then we see a drop in that lead hand distribution. Now, um, you know one of the things I think, you know, when I think about a lot of players that hook, 
I've felt like for a, you know, a long time, a lot of them, maybe not all, but they use that trail hand to rotate the club face closed. And so if that trail hand was to apply pressure, that last instant closing the club face, well, that explains the drop in lead hand pressure, right? That relationship of lead hand to trail hand is always going to add up to 100%. Okay, here we go with the slicers. All right, now again, um, we see a little bit of a, a drop in transition, but then again, we see quite a, you know, from lead arm parallel to shaft parallel, we see a pretty good spike and, you know, initially in kind of flat lines. So, you know, again, I feel like that early trail hand pressure to me is synonymous with pushing that center of mass of the club, pushing the club head farther away from the body, leading to an out to in path, in which case I'm going to have to leave the face open in order to try and create any type of playable golf shot. Now here's our four contact, high handicap, whatever you want to call it. Super interesting pattern here. Again, kind of synonymous with what we found in the first study. Um, you know, starts really, really, really high, continues to drop all the way into the downswing. And then I see that trail hand kind of start to take over and apply pressure to the club. Here's all four of them uh, imposed on top of each other. Now, one of the things I find interesting, um, you know, when I look at the blue line at the good players, they start with the least amount of lead hand grip pressure. So let's say, you know, the most balanced for a 50-50 grip. Not saying that's good, but if it keeps popping up, maybe it's a good starting point. And then when we get all the way to the end to contact, we see that that low handicap player has the most distribution of pressure, again, still with the lead hand. So big variability within it, but uh, driven by the lead hand pressure. Now, what I've got here is just a, a quick video I'm going to play. But you're going to see there's uh, one of our professionals on one side and one of the high handicappers on the other side. See this contrast in real time. Now, this graph is showing us uh, the percentage of max. That's also reflected by the white numbers underneath the big numbers in the circle. Work through this. Again, I know a lot going on. Uh, I found this to be really interesting is looking at the speed generation curve, right? So with gears, we can map out the club head speed. But when we look at the slope of that club head speed, we can see the acceleration. Get down here to shaft parallel, massive change in distribution and huge change in slope of the club head speed generation. I think those graphs make it pretty easy to see just how different the, uh, you know, pressure application is, you know, to the club. Here's the last one I want you guys to take a look at. This is a uh, slicer on the left, hook on the right. So one of the things we observed with the players that hook, when they get to that shaft parallel position, they had the highest amount of lead hand pressure and they had the least amount of pelvis rotation. Here we can see this. The uh, players that slice tended to have the most amount of pelvis rotation at this position, and also the most amount of trail hand pressure. So interesting to see the way those two work together to create club delivery. Everything from, you see, nine degrees inside out to I'm not sure what it was, six to seven outside in. So going through these drivers, a couple things, I guess, observations, right? So we can't, we can't say we know, we can't say it's fact, but things that we kept seeing. Um, when we look at weaker players, that means high handicap, poor ball strikers. They had less variability of grip pressure over the course of the swing. So the way I think about that is almost like they started off squeezing it pretty stinking tight and they just kept hanging on for dear life you know, moving that club around the body. Um, and I think this is normal when I talk to a lot of high handicap players they are trying to eliminate moving parts, eliminate variability. So it seems natural to me that trying to squeeze the club and have it move in a constant arc would be logical for them to make sense. 
And I think, you know, we've got a great opportunity for education, right? When we can teach people what really happens, we can change our perception. When we change our perception, we can change behavior. When we change behavior, we change performance. At the end of the day, people see us to change performance. There we see our better players have more variability of grip pressure and the lead hand was much more dominant. As we talked about and saw in that second last video, um, you see again this kind of double pressure or double peak, little squeeze here, relax, big squeeze here down through contact. Not sure if it's something we actively want to teach, but it's good to know that it's happening. All right. Um, that bottom one I want to just highlight for a second. Um, within each subject, you know, N is one, sample size one, whatever you want to call it, uh, for both good and bad shots, the grip pressure application over the course of the swing is quite consistent. Right? So it's the subtleties of contact point and face angle control um, you know, is where we see the difference between controlling consistently, I guess, creating the same shot shape as opposed to not doing so. And yeah, uh, simple, but the people with the highest grip strengths at the highest club head speeds, it's something that we've now integrated start of our standardized intake process. And we're also going to be implementing uh, quarterly annual checks along the way to make sure that we at least maintain it. And if it's going down, we can educate our clients and at least try and, you know, help them know like, hey, you should maintain this if you want to maintain club head speed. All right, let's talk a little bit about wedges and uh, then we'll see if anyone has any energy left. We'll open the floor for questions. Okay, so remember we tested uh, low shots and high shots, uh, 30 yards. The yellow line is showing me the low wedge. The gray line is showing me the high wedge. So I didn't really know what to expect on this. All I could do is think about my feels the feels I have, I definitely felt like, you know, say when I was a good wedge player, when I used to practice and all that good stuff, I did feel like I was pretty trail hand dominant. And I also gravitated much, you know, much more towards the high shots. You know, if I had to play the ball down a bump and run, I would do it by changing the loft as opposed to changing technique. So when I looked at this initially, you know, it seemed kind of logical, I suppose. Um, Let's go here, and we're just going to look at our high handicap players. This was super interesting. So um, I'm applying the same amount of pressure with each hand in the same basic pattern over the course of the entire motion. No wonder our you know, higher handicap amateur golfers don't have the ability to effectively manipulate control when I apply the same forces through the club you know, it's unlikely I'm going to get a different result. Now, of course, there could be some modifications where people will change, you know, some ball position or some alignment stuff that we didn't account for, and we can get some subtle, uh, you know, subtle changes in ball flight. But I really did think this was quite telling. Um, here's those two. Again, I just want to put these two up side by side so you're able to just see how different this is. Um and I'm going to go, yeah, so here's all of the different groups. And again, what I, what, I, what I found super interesting about this study is like when we're looking at the full swing, we start our professional players. We started with the least amount of lead hand pressure. And at contact, we got to the most amount of lead hand pressure. And when we looked at the people that struggle with ball striking skills, they started with, you know, the opposite. They ended up with more trail hand pressure at contact, literally just doing it backwards of what we saw with the good players. And now in the wedges, we see the exact opposite. So when we see low lead hand pressure, we know there's higher trail hand pressure. And, you know, we see the highest trail hand pressure coming from the best players. And we see the highest lead hand pressure coming from, you know, those that have admittedly struggled with short game. So I just think there's such interesting coaching applications across all shots, not just one particular one. 
Now we got uh, one video here. Hopefully this does a pretty good job of illustrating just how different Pretty massive difference there. And now the other thing too, not only is the distribution different, but look at how different the magnitudes are, right? That high handicap player is squeezing the club so hard. It's actually harder with both hands than when they did the calibration, as opposed to you see, you know, our professional player at a much lower uh, uh, magnitude. So with... Uh, you know, with the wedge play, our, our professional players had the most trail hand pressure. They had the most consistent. So there actually wasn't a ton of variability, unlike in the full swing where they exhibited the amount of variability over the course of the swing. Uh, we look at, if we look at the, the change in pressure distribution for a professional player hitting a low shot to a high shot, there was twice as much change. Right, twice as much delta and increased pressure of that trail hand for them to hit the high shot versus the low shot. And I think there's something significant to be teased out there. Uh, and also the professional players had a much lower percentage of the maximum grip pressure that they displayed during the calibration process. Now, um, at the golf lab, we found this really interesting. I hope that you guys sitting there in Phoenix right now find it interesting, but at the end of the day, like, what do we do with it? So here's some stuff we started doing. Well, the first, going back to that very first piece of information, one of the first sessions for every single new golf lab client is going to be grip size optimization, where we built a grip fitting kit. It's pretty simple, five shafts, five different sizes of grips. And we're literally just looking at dispersion. What's going to give us the tightest dispersion? What gives us more consistent closure rate? Um, one thing that we have not done yet, but I expect we'll start experimenting with on the backside of this study, if we see different optimum pressure application patterns for different shot types, it leads me to believe that different sizes of grips on different clubs could assist in that pattern development for different players. Uh, I've found myself giving a lot of grip modification drills, you know, whether that's Classics like uh, Hogan's three fingers, you know, taking this off the club, do a lot more lead hand swings, both in warm up and drill work for full swing. I do a lot more uh, trail hand, uh, short game only stuff that just helps, you know, help people get those feels, get that kinesthetic awareness that they can then transfer to when they put both hands on the club. Uh, you know, this has been interesting for me just personally as a coach um when i was new and i had no tech and i didn't know what the hell i was doing all i would talk about is my feels and what i thought like i did when i used to play pretty good golf uh you know and then you get in this world of measurables and uh we have so much more information and started to find myself giving a lot more dialogue about gross motor patterns about footwork and pressure shifts, whether sequencing, whatever it is. And now with this information, I feel like I'm back to where, I feel like it's, you know, again, responsible or maybe more responsible. I can speak in a more educated way to things to feel in the hands. You know, little things like once you get to the top, feel like you let go with your right hand on the way down, you know, and not everything's perfect, but it's like a whole new language of cues, a whole new dialogue I can have with the client. Uh, you know, and some things that for all of us to learn, what's the best way to deliver this information? I'm sure it's different with different people, but you know, I'm a right-handed player. So does that mean I best receive cueing about my right hand or should it be about the hand that's supposed to exert the most pressure, the least pressure? We don't know, but these are the things we're experimenting with, with different people every day. And, you know, grip strength testing and maintenance, I alluded to that earlier, you know, significant portion of our membership is north of 50. You know, as I say, they're 
on a constant state of decay. And one of the simplest things that we can do is help them maintain their grip pressure to maintain their club head speed. When they maintain their club head speed, they maintain their distance. When they maintain their distance, they keep playing. When they keep playing, they keep renewing their membership. When they keep renewing their membership, we get to have a vacation in the winter. So um, pretty simple economics there. That, uh, that concludes all the information I had prepared. So I'm actually going to just work my way back in here to my seat and see if anyone had any questions on any of that stuff. Any questions? I've got a mic. Hi, I was just wondering about um, if you did any studies about the position of the grip. Like, does that make a difference if they have a weak or a strong grip? Because, you know, I teach a lot of ladies and they have very weak grips. So the club head will twist when they hit it. Is it because their grip is weak uh, or is it because the club is twisting the ball? Yeah, great question. Um, it was measured and I'm going to say at this point, I don't know. So with the wrist calibration, similar if you're familiar with an AMM, we're able to take a look at basically like the top hand pronation, bottom hand supination to extract the actual hand placement on the handle. Um, we just haven't been able to process that data yet. And, you know, one thing and, you know, open to comment from anyone in the room and you can always send stuff out through social media with a sample set that small. One question I have would be, should we look at all the strong grips together? Sorry, bad term, but, you know, left hand on top together, or should we further subcategorize it by uh, professional player strong grip, uh, you know, high handicapper strong grip? So sorry, I don't have the answers. I've only got questions, but um, definitely something I think would have an effect. That's great. Any other questions? Okay, Liam, I just, this is Kelly. I just want to say thank you so much. You are absolutely the man for being here <laughs> and we wish you all the best and we hope that you're feeling better soon, but really great, great presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, again, thanks everyone at 8 a.m. for putting this on. I wish I could be there. I hope everyone in the room appreciates how special these gatherings are, enjoys your time out there. And man, I hope to see you guys next year. And, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out directly through uh, social or you know, whatever, if there's any other questions I can help with. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. And I, and I just add a little bit to that, you know, people like me need people like you because a lot of what I do is by instinct and I see things that work, but when we get the scientists and the people that measure everything and they come back with, well, yes, this is what you should be doing. And this is why it's just super, super helpful to all the teachers. So thank you once again. I appreciate it. Thanks Kelly. We're, uh, we're doing what we can. Great.